Welcome to Creative University, everybody. I'm Peter Chotti. I'm the chairman and co-founder, together with my wife, Louisa, uh, and my family, my two children, Hunter and Luca, who are out there. Uh, but welcome to Creative University. Many of you have attended many of these sessions. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting one. They always are interesting, but this is the first of my new mind-blowing series. But this will be, I think, a great way to start out the mind-blowing series uh, with my interview of YouTube's head of brand strategy, Nicholas Sells. There he is. Nicholas Sells is joining me from YouTube, the head of brand strategy and much more than that. But Nick, great to see you. Thanks for having me, Peter. Super excited to, for our conversation today and to, to catch up and talk about some really crazy shit. Oh, there's cra crazy, crazy <laughs> shit. We did am a I allowed, is shit a curse word? Am yeah. I allowed to say shit in well, the you, creative, you did. creative university forum? Yeah, is, that, so is that kosher? Well, Nick, it's a safe place. Okay. Okay, it's a safe place. And if we offended anybody, they'll let us know about it. By the <laughs> way, everyone, send in your questions via chat or the Q&A function because we'll save some room at the very end, but we're going to go rapid fire. So after I give your bio, Nick, I'm going to ask you about that song, okay? All right. So really quickly. So Nick is, as I said, the head of brand strategy, operations, and product marketing at YouTube and chief of staff of YouTube's global brand VP. He joined YouTube in 2011, which blows my mind because Nick's like 22 right now. So he must have been like 12. <laughs> he must have been 12 when he joined YouTube. He's played a critical role in several of YouTube's most important initiatives. So coordinating YouTube marketing's response to COVID-19, which is very cool launching and growing YouTube originals, launching YouTube's ad-supported live sports business, including MLB Game of the Week, launching and growing YouTube subscription business, YouTube Premium, growing its ad-supported licensed film business, building YouTube marketing's first ever strategy and research team, establishing YouTube marketing's first ever Los Angeles office where he's calling in from, well, not in the office because nobody's in the office, but nonetheless, and just a couple more snippets. In 2016, among his many accolades, he was selected by Forbes as one of the top 30 under 30 in media and entertainment. Should have been top under 20, but whatever. He is a graduate, <laughs> he's a graduate of Yale University where he studied cognitive science with a focus on behavioral economics. So kind of tells you what this conversation is gonna be like. He loves soccer and improv comedy. Maybe we'll do another session of improv. And he tells me that he recently has gone way too far down the rabbit hole learning about Taoist and existential philosophy. <laughs> okay, so there we go. So um, there's never been a more, I think, um, kind of cr confused title that I put to the, these kind of talks. <laughs> there's a reason for that. But before we dig in, why did you choose the song that you chose, which was What a Life from the movie Another Round? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the, the most logical answer is I watched that movie recently and it's one of those like earworm songs that kind of gets in your head. But it really, I think it resonated with me because what I've found, I, I'm generally an optimist by trade. And I think if we learned one thing in 2020, it was that, there, you know, the current new cycle, the current environment we're in, it's very easy to sometimes kind of get down on yourself or get lost in the muck of what's happening in certain parts of, you know, racial justice or our political system or our economy with so many people, um, you know, unfortunately losing their jobs and struggling with work and stuff. And what I also saw at the same time in media though, was you also began to see this trend of, you know, people like certain content that was overly kind of highlighting the good that was also existing in the world, really breaking through. So you think about, you know, John Krasinski of, you know, the office fame, yep. um, he did this whole uh, show on YouTube called um, SGN, which stood for Some Good News. And it was literally just him, like in his boxers, I think most of the time, you know, doing like a FACO daily show style news format, but where everything was just highlighting the good that people were doing for each other. 
um, out in the world. And then on Apple TV, you had the show Ted Lasso, um, which was about, you know, this American football coach who then goes to try to teach a soccer team. And it was one of the most successful shows of last year when, you know, thousands of different movies and shows were being released. And, and what a lot of people like pulled out from that was the main character Ted Lasso was just this abundantly optimistic, like can do good thing. And so that was one thread that really just jumped out at me was like, even amidst all these challenges that we're having that like, if you, if you search for good, there are people doing good and there are people trying to help and there's these good stories existing. And so the, the refrain from the course about what a life to me, I think is just a nice reminder of, you know, to, to, to search for the, the light and the darkness a little bit. And that, you know, even now with the, the vaccine news coming out and it, it feels like we're all kind of holding hands and beginning to come out of this challenging time. And we have a lot more challenges ahead of us, but it's a nice reminder to try to stay grounded, stay present and, and know that there's still a lot of good and magic happening in the world. Well, Nick, there's a lot of good and magic happening with you and, and joining <laughs> Creative University and doing this. So, uh, like I said, I, I just want to tell everybody out there that Nick is a, a deep thinker. Like, I love discussing philosophical questions. And a lot of these times, the, these sessions are great all the time. You know, practical, all of that. This will be very practical because he's going to be pointing the way to the future, but also getting into the issues of humanity and touching upon impacts on all of us about some of the things that were the mind blowing things that we're, we will be talking about. Nick, you identified with me five areas of mind blowing stuff and we're gonna have to go really rapid fire on this, but start. Go all right. You, it's, it's, it's all you. All right, well, so I think for context, Peter and I were chatting and we were talking about what are some of the things that could be most interesting to chat about today. And I think one of the things that's so fascinating on YouTube is that, you know, you, you are at this weird uh, position where you're really at the intersection of like what's happening in media, what's happening in culture and what's happening in society. And in my 10 years at the company, what I've generally found is some of the trends that you begin to see taking off on YouTube certainly are become leading indicators of these broader trends happening in society. And so what we thought we would do today is to just kind of look at some of those trends, talk about them very briefly, because we have to get through them real All quick. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, and so so the first one that that we're seeing, which I think is just fascinating, is um, and Peter, you're gonna have to keep me on time because you know I'll just keep chatting about this stuff because I love it. But um, know, and not that's not to be rude. It's just that no, no, no. You're you're doing God's work here right now, Peter. It's all good. <laughs> um, so the first trend, like when most people think about an influencer, right? They tend to have a, an idea in their head, and a lot of times the influencers maybe tend to skew maybe a little bit younger, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, maybe you think of like the Logan Pauls of the world or, um, you know, the, the Charlie Diamellos or, you know, the influencer tends to have this slightly youngish view to it. And I think what we're really seeing right now, which is fascinating, is the archetype of what a content creator is, is just totally being blown to smithereens at the moment. And there's a couple, well, I'll give two quick examples and then we'll kind of dive in deep on the third, which is one of the ones that I still find to be kind of a little bit mind, uh, mind blowing. So like one is, first off, we saw all last year that like um, older creators are now blowing up. Like there's creators all over the world in the US, gaming creator grandmas in Germany that are over 80 years old and have millions of subscribers. Um, and it, they're loving it because it's entertainment and purpose. And then they've just found this audience because they're resonating authentically with these um, slightly older creators who just love gaming. Um, a second trend that we're seeing is it, you know, it used to be like you're a beauty creator, you're an automotive creator, you're a, a, a comedian. And increasingly, we're now seeing um, the blending of genres. So you have, you know, uh, beauty vloggers that are then creating content with like a true crime commentary to it, 
where they'll have like um, murder Mondays where they show you how to get up for the, you know, get fully beautied up for the first day of the week, but then also as they're putting on the makeup, we'll tell you like a grisly murder story that they heard in the news like the week before. Wow. And so all these traditional categorizations are just completely becoming flexible. And I think the most flexible categorization that's beginning to happen is, uh, is this creator human? Mm -hmm. Right. And by the way, just to, so on this one, there is going to be a full session on synthetic media, which is the next one in two weeks. So we'll touch upon it. That's going to be a deep dive with one of the leading companies that's doing this stuff that it's crazy. So go. Yeah. And I highly recommend you tune into that follow up because I think this will be like an amuse bouche and you're going to want to learn more because it's going to be the future. Like the reality is right now, this was a trend that started in Japan and then it started in 2016. And really over the last four years as um, motion and facial tracking technology has gotten a lot better, we've now seen the number of virtual creators, sometimes you'll call them uh, VTubers for virtual YouTubers, um, has started to blow up. They now have over 1.5 billion views of virtual tubers a month as of October of last year. Uh, and what's so fascinating about this is, you know, it starts to blur the lines of like, one, what does it really mean? Like, from a, from a consumer perspective, like the fact that people are tuning in to see these virtual creators that are literally like, there's no, you know a human identity behind them yeah and they're resonating with them as strongly as the you know blood blood sweat and bone creators yeah that exist it's you know it's bringing up this really interesting question around like well what is it actually why what is it about talent that really resonates with us and do it does it have to be a human person all of these trends tend to suggest that they probably don't need to be well and this is the like um we're gonna have another session, like I said, on the music side, what it means for artists, but just think of some of the things that have already happened. Kind of the obvious ones like Princess Leia showing up in the most recent Star Wars, even though Carrie Fisher passed away many years ago. And yet she was a full blown like leading actor in that latest one. And that's just the beginnings of some of the things. So if you can imagine like Tom Cruise, um, getting paid to be acting in the next Mission Impossible 25 or whatever it is. And he, he, all he needs to do is be scanned and they can just animate his body and he doesn't have to show up on set. Uh, and you have a virtual set anyhow. It's all computerized because like in Mandalorian, it's all synthetic anyhow. You know, it's an all 270 degree screen. So what does this mean? I'll give you 30 seconds to answer that question. Like, what do you see Hollywood being like in 30 years? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell it to you from the consumer side and from the business side. So yeah. from the business side first, I think what you're seeing is um, a lot of time, there's a lot of benefits that talent agents, producers see with virtual creators mm -hmm. that they're really excited about. So like one is simple negotiation. Like I'll help, you know, uh, break this brand new artist, but as they rightfully should be, you know, they're now a star, they're going to demand a premium uh, salary. But if you're a virtual tuber, you know, you, there's no cost implications. There go those costs. There goes those costs. <laughs> and also like the PR risk, you know, you don't have to worry about like your VTuber having, you know, a little bit too much champagne after the club and then like crashing their SUV because they don't drive yeah so like from an economic standpoint and from a pr standpoint you know these studios honestly probably to a, to a point of being problematic they really care about control and you now have this new talent that that they're able to fully control and so i think it really appeals to them and using and data like, using data to create that character in the first place to understand what characters have resonated with audiences out there so taking like a little Michaela who's completely virtual and there's a reason why she 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 has resonated and you know and then AI continuously learning and turning on that data to improve 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 
and then create a story like this. So Nick, one last thought on that. We got to move on to the second. Yeah. Uh, so the last thought on that, I think I'll just cover off on the, the consumer piece, which is, you know, I think they're, they're I'll give you the most extreme, like sci-fi version of this for a second. Um, there's a bit of a loneliness epidemic right now, right? People are stuck at home. They're feeling disconnected from each other. And there's other people that potentially in the world that are like struggling to find their, their community, their crew. Now, what if there's a world where, you know, if, if you resonate just as powerfully in a connection with, with a virtual being as you do with a primary being, like you could begin to see a universe where you have companies that are just kind of creating your own custom friend for you, where people are already primarily interacting with these friend groups in virtual worlds like League of Legends or Fortnite. So if you already take away the physical component of it, there's gonna be a whole economy around these virtual humans and the goods and services that they can provide where I think the, the connection between what we think of when we think about our friend group and our community is gonna be completely shifted as a result of that. Crazy stuff. We could go so much deeper on all of this. So, but I'm gonna then ask you to introduce the, the second of the mind blowing themes that you see. Yeah, so, and that, that's actually a good connecting point. We mentioned things like Fortnite and League of Legends. And I think what you're beginning to see here is how, um, Anum, that's a great question. We can get to that in the Q&A. Um, interactive content, it, it's starting to result in more and more um, of these interesting dynamics where like, you know, Travis Scott, um, massive A-list star, he goes and you know does a virtual concert in Fortnite that had 12 million attendees. That's more than pretty much maybe any physical concert has ever had before due to and it, it broke his, and it broke a number one song for him. And it broke a number one song for him. And so you know I I just the, all of this is the blending of the digital versus the physical. And also, you know, people can interact directly with Travis Scott's character in Fortnite in a way that they can't in, you know, the Madison Square Garden or something of that nature. And then if you want to go really far down the rabbit hole, another trend that we saw at YouTube was there were actually people who were filming themselves doing reaction videos to themselves watching the virtual concert in Fortnite. So you then had an audience of people watching people watching a virtual concert in a video game. And these videos were getting millions and millions of subscribers. And so the like old broadcast was like, you know, it's in the name, it's broadcast. You sit there and people that you've never met in boardrooms tell you what you should watch. And now what you're seeing more and more is people are like deciding what they want to watch. They're then remixing this content where they're doing like reaction videos. And they're also then having the conversations that happen outside the video kind of become part of the content itself. So, you know, another great example of this, I think people probably on this call are pretty familiar with the advent of esports and of the whole economy of people watching people playing video games. What people might be a little bit less familiar with is how that dynamic is actually coming now to, to live sports as well. And so we saw this, one of my favorite trends last year on YouTube was what we call watch alongs. And this was where people were filming videos of like fans of different teams watching the same game and then reacting live to it. So you might have, you know, the New England Patriots playing the Green Bay Packers and they would kind of like you, you, instead of watching the game, you would see a live stream of like a room of New England Patriots fans on one side and Green Bay Packer fans on the other. And they would be live streaming their own reactions to the game that you're watching live. And these just blew up because it gave a sense of like the fan experience that everybody craves. You know, it's so much more fun generally to be watching this live sporting event with other hardcore fans and it's, it's the stadium experience. And so next year, I mean, Peter, you and I were chatting about this. For those that don't know, there's a bunch of really big 
um, sports rights negotiations that are happening right now where, you know, Fox and ESPN and CBS are all, you know, uh, vying to be able to get the rights to show NFL games in the future. And Amazon is largely believed to be one of the leading buyers to potentially get like the Thursday night football game package. Now, if they do, I can guarantee you that what you're going to begin to see is more and more of these interactive features kind of being embedded into the game such that your sports watching experience can become more and more customized. Yeah, for um, sure. And especially since they own the, they own the Twitch platform. So, you know, that's hundred percent. I completely agree with you. I think that live for Amazon and bringing that in one, one quick company that I want to mention that I think is doing just along those lines of immersing yourself in different ways. So it's not just watching each other, but interacting in an immersive environment, which ultimately will feel like you, your mind will feel like you're there. Your mind will. It's a company called Red Pill VR, Red Pill VR. You should check it out. Um, what they do is they enable what they call like teleportation. So Diplo or your favorite DJ, Major Laser may be spinning uh, and you're actually able to, you're in your place, your place, your friends in their place. You're actually, you can take on a character, you can be yourself and you're dancing together and you're able to interact with, with Diplo who's spinning live in the Netherlands, wherever he is, and you you feel, and I've tried it, you feel like you're actually in there and you're able to do superhuman things like climb trees. It's crazy stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> Check out Red Pill VR. Okay, let's go to mind blowing number three. Sure. So I think, you know, I, the third thing is uh, there's probably an app that I imagine many people on this uh, call have heard of. It's a little thing called TikTok kind of became a really big deal in 2020. I think last count, it has over 800 million active users around the world. And that's actually, despite the fact that the entire app was banned in all of India, which is yeah. the second most populous country in the world. So, you know, kind of a big deal. But I think what, what's been really interesting is to look at the way that TikTok is being used by the music industry and to start to project out a little bit about like what this could mean for the future of the music industry. And so, you know, maybe I, you, I know we don't have a ton of time, so maybe we, we focus in on like one of my favorite examples, which is um, there was a TikTok user called Dogface208. And he was, it's a video, maybe some people have seen it. It's a video of Dogface208 riding a skateboard while just drinking ocean spray cranberry juice. Yeah. And you wouldn't think that this would be a big deal. There's probably many other similar videos like it. But the thing that made it fascinating was that video in, in the background, it had the song Dreams by Fleetwood Mac. Now that song Dreams, amazing song, you know, it peaked at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, but it did that when the song was launched back in 1977. I remember it, hasn't on, <laughs> it hasn't been on the charts for, for decades. Uh, but when, um, we'll get to that question. Yeah, we'll get to all these questions at the end, guys. We'll save time. Great questions, though. And Nick, by the way, if you can stick pa a little past the hour, um, we can make sure we answer all the questions. But go ahead. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so, you know, Dogface's video of him skateboarding, drinking ocean spray blows up, and it actually results in Fleetwood Mac's song Dreams, um, like peaking again on the Billboard Top 100 chart, all the way at 12. And what's interesting is like the TikTok plays don't necessarily translate into like they're not included in Billboard's calculations because they're only snippets of songs. So the user behavior that was happening where people were watching this video of dog face skateboarding, hearing this song, being like, oh, that's an interesting song. And then actively going to whatever your primary music service is, whether or not it's YouTube music or Spotify or Apple music, searching for the song and playing it. And, and the music industry started to really um, focus in on this phenomenon. It, it TikTok effectively became one of the primary discovery engines for new music. Totally. For YouTube in, in 2020. And, and what's scary about it a little bit is the format for that is just, it's a 15 second song snippet. 
And so you begin to see this world. And again, we're, you know, future shocking here. We don't know if this will come to pass, but it used to be that you would have, you know, the, the, the two CD double disc version and you'd have, you know, 40 songs on it. And then when Apple iTunes took off, you started to, you know, you could buy songs one at a time. The number of tracks on a given release started to, to reduce. You would have LPs of three or five songs. And in some cases you would have, you know, EDM artists just releasing one single at a time. They, they didn't even bother sending out a CD. And the question that I'm asking myself is, you know, do we get to a world where, you know, artists don't even necessarily feel the need to release even like a full three minute track? Like, is that going to become blase? If you can just create a kick ass 20 second hook and then use that to drive discovery of the catalog of your other music or to drive interest in uh, a touring um, you know, concert tour that you do, which is where most of these music artists make their money anyway, you know, does suddenly even like a three minute song become a thing of the past? Well, right. I mean, think about your favorite artist and they create a 20 second hook, like you said, and they put it out there and say, go to town on it, everybody, feel free to use it, but you're able to use YouTube technology to identify every song that incorporated that 20 second hook and then pay out a share of ad revenues to back to the original songwriter whose 20 second hook it was. I mean, imagine that. Like, and that's just one tiny example. I don't think that's future shock, future shock at all. I think that's already happening. Um, and then, you know, some future shock is kind of like what I mentioned, the artificial intelligence songwriter. So yeah. it's, what happens to the songwriter when you have AI that's just looking at everything that succeeded in creating a hit, let's say creating a hit, and then reformulating that, like a lot of the hit makers do, um, that's kind of what they do anyhow to create yeah. a hit, but just churning out millions of songs. And think about this. If you, if you have AI that's churning out millions of songs and you only get a hundred listens to each song, that's okay. You're still generating massive amounts of money. And so like, just think about it from the music side, but. And I also you think like your, your point, um, you know, what we're talking about here is a world where it used to be, if, if you think about the trend of automation and it used to be like, okay, cool. Well, you know, a, a machine might be able to, uh, you know, help uh, vacuum my floor with a Roomba, but oh, they'll never drive cars. And now you're like, oh shit, like autonomous vehicles are coming. Well, they can drive a car, but they're never gonna paint a Picasso. And so I think the, the, the line of what we expect machines to be able to kind of do and to do better than humans, like is starting to become further and further to the right. And it brings up these fascinating existential questions about like one, you know, do we, would we pay as much? Would we value art done by a machine as much as art done by a human? If we didn't know the difference, would we care? If we do know the difference, then what does that tell us about the value of art? If the fact that we know that this was created by a machine makes us value it less than if we know that it's created by a human. And does the trend that we're seeing with video YouTubers mean that in reality, we actually might not value the human element maybe just as much as we think we do? It's going to be very interesting. I mean, look, you know, there, there's the whole phenomenon that's kind of blends some of this NFTs. Everybody I'm having yes. conversations with in the music business is talking about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. If you don't know, probably most of you do, but if you don't know about non-fungible tokens, NFTs, that is a, one of the hottest topics in the media and entertainment world right now. And like Kings of Leon just released their latest album as an NFT. Grimes just um, in one 24 hour period um, sold $6 million of art, of digital art via NFTs. So that's another one. I wanna ask you one question. You mentioned yeah. Dogface, the guy who's on the, on the skateboard. Like yeah. you said, gazillions of people create those kind of videos. You're the head of brand strategy at YouTube. Why did that one break through? And, I'll, and again, I'll give you 30 seconds on that one because we have to move to number four. Yeah. 
So it's um, <laughs> part of it is weird magic that nobody understands. And then part of it is this weird machine that's happening behind the scenes. Now the magic, whoever figures out why like Bernie Sanders middens are just gonna start to like blow up on the internet, that person's gonna have billions of dollars. There's just something around um, the magic of like a, an image that makes you laugh or cry or reminds you of yourself that just makes someone watch something and fundamentally want to share it. And that's like the basic components of what drives reality. You watch something and there's something in it that makes you want to share it, but it's really hard to define. No, it, no. it is, but like that, but there's so many videos that are, you are, um, uh, what's the word? It's not equivalent to it, but certainly, um, you know, relevant to that genre. So it's just like, what is it? Do you think a brand like Ocean Spray saw it happening and then somehow put their machine yeah. underneath it and bubbled it up further and then contacted TikTok and bubbled yeah. it up? Yeah. No, it's a great question. And I think, and this brings you to the second point, which is the, the machine behind the magic a little bit, where what people sometimes don't realize is, especially in the, the TikTok ecosystem, you have the platform that has all this data on what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, and then what they'll do is they'll kind of look at their signals and their dashboards and they'll start to see that something due to the magic is beginning to pop. And then what they'll do is they'll take that insight and they'll reach out to the, the music world and they'll see like, hey guys, FYI, you know, this, this video with this kind of song is just you know beginning to pop you might want to put something behind it or to, to remix it and then they'll also reach out to the creator community and they'll begin to seed uh you know insights like hey we see this trend beginning to yeah. go up on tiktok you should participate yeah so the platform uses the data to inform what's beginning to to heat up and then they'll reach out to the creator community and to the music community to then kind of give them an insight that they might want to jump on this train that's about to leave the station. And that creates this positive feedback loop where then more creators participate in the dance, which creates more awareness around it, which makes more people want to participate, more people listen to the song, which then helps the music pop. Excellent. So number four. Number four. Yes. Um, <laughs> number four is, a rapid fire man i know this is great i uh, I, I wish also, like, you, i can't see anybody like there's no sense of audience you have no idea if everyone's like falling asleep or totally bored out of their mind or just like well, let, anyone's let, even out there <laughs> there's so much good stuff here it's hard there's so much information <laughs> thank you jasmine you're making me feel validated i appreciate you thank you so let's go to number four because it's 1147 and I want to make sure that we can touch upon at least those and then leave time for everybody. And like I said, guys, for those of you who can stay longer, we'll, Nick will stay longer to answer some questions um, and I'll stick around too. And at the end of quick Nick's Q and A, if you have questions about Creative University, I'm happy to do it, but go ahead, Nick. Let's talk about number four that you see. Um, yeah, so number four, so this is, uh, this is, we're going to go into like the zone of just like pure joy and like wonkiness and just pure WTF-ness, um, which is uh, crowdsource creativity. Um, you know, Peter said, I, I've, I've dabbled in improv. I think it's a, a brilliant art form. And what we've seen is the internet is just a lot, like it used to be you know, in the traditional film, you would have like a single writer or director or, you know, an artist, you'd have a couple people who would be, you know, own the copyright for a song. But with one, the internet enabling, you know, unrivaled connectivity, and then two, with COVID making it so everyone has been dispersed, you know, working or living from home back in their communities, in 2020, we saw these incredible examples of um, distributed creativity, where one of my personal favorites was um, the Ratatouille musical. So Ratatouille, uh, Pixar movie, you know, maybe 20, 20 ish, yeah. plus or minus a couple of years, 20 ish years old. 
Um, so when you were um, born? Yeah, exactly. I was actually before I was born. So I, I you know, in <laughs> utero, I could just hear the songs. Um, yes, Remy the Ratatouille. So for those less familiar, the TLDR is it's about a, a, a rat that has gourmet skills as a chef. Um, really great movie. Why is this coming up now? So a bunch of people on the internet, while they were bored, very organically decided that Ratatouille should be a musical. And so uh, the original movie was not a musical. It was pure, you know, comedy slash drama. But so different individual creators on their own just started to create what they thought like an example of a song from this yet to exist Ratatouille musical would sound like. And if you study musicals, there's, you know, within the, the field, there are certain types of songs. So you have like the opening number where different characters are introduced. And then you have like the, the dramatic hook where the conflict is introduced. And so people would say, I think that there's uh, you know, this type of song number four in this yet to be created Ratatouille musical is going to be called Anyone Can Cook. And they created the music and they filmed themselves on it and they just like put it on YouTube and put it on TikTok. And then other people saw those videos and they're like, oh my God, you're right. That is song number four. I bet this is song number six. And then someone else was like, hey guys, if there's a musical where this is song four, six, and nine, I bet this is what the playbill for that musical would look like. And they graphic designed a playbill for this musical that was yet to exist. So organically over time, people were submitting, this is what I think the costumes will look like. And this is what I think um, who would be a great cast member for the show. And again, all for the show that did not exist whatsoever. Now, like all good musicals, the story actually has an incredible happy ending where, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial producer saw all this passion and love and viewership that was happening. And they went to Disney, who for context, Peter will tell you, is like notorious for being overly protective of their IP. You will get a cease and desist letter before you can even pick up a pen to write the word, you know. Ratatouille, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, look, we have all this love. We pretty much have created the musical at this point. We have all the songs and the costumes and the props. Can we just do this? And Disney said yes. They said yes, and they got, you know, a couple producers and um, uh, musical uh, produ uh, like lyricists to write the book. And and those people who you know were like Tony Award winning talent. Um, they were smart. They're like, look, this was born and, and bred from the internet community. So they, it wasn't like they took this as an opportunity to rewrite everything from scratch. They actually went and took all the different pieces that different members of the YouTube and TikTok community had put out there and kind of were more just the, the coordinators to pull these pieces together. And the, the musical premiered. Uh, they raised over a million dollars for a charity that does great work kind of supporting the, awesome. the actors fund i think it was i think it was the actors fund um but a charity that that the broadway community supports and it was so popular disney's commitment was they're like you can do this once and never again because again it's it's disney um but it was so popular disney let them run it a second time yeah and it was just it's such a brilliant example of just Pe like how people are putting their passions out there and then working together with people who literally might be in another country halfway around the world to create these new pieces of art and music um, that are coming together. And By the way, I, I think that's a great example. And that's something that can happen not only in just like that remote collaboration, remote inspiration. All of you, if somebody's on the East Coast, somebody's on the West Coast, you're in the Midwest, wherever you are in France, we have people overseas. If you see somebody and you're texting and you're chatting or you're chatting and you see somebody and there's an idea, you can reach out directly to them. You don't need Creative University to do it. Just go to the LinkedIn page and there's a way to collaborate that way. And who knows what you can come up with. Um, we'll get to number five. I want to touch upon just one quick thing. If you want to see how an artist brings her fans into the creative process in a crowdsourced kind of way um, that's analogous to this, Grimes again. Um, so 
Grimes is just an artist who's out there. There's, you know, Elon Musk is out there. Grimes is out there. There's no, it's no surprise that the two of them are together and having a, a child that is named after numerically. So yeah, good like, luck trying to, to pronounce that name. <laughs> check out, check out Grimes. Okay, now we'll get to number five. We have only a couple minutes and then we'll start answering questions. Yeah, and, and you know, I think to me five is, it, it, of all the trends we've talked about, I think it's the one that is, it, it's less kind of internet specific and it feels most a reflection of what we're seeing happen civically and socially. Um, which was the way that digital media was being used to um, help people kind of overcome both their, their personal, but also societal adversity. And, you know, we saw this in a couple of ways, like, you know, first and foremost, you know, as I mentioned this earlier, but like mental health is such an issue right now. Totally. Loneliness truly is a pandemic and it's been made worse as a result of COVID. And what you saw was more and more people just missing community and missing human contact and missing connection. And what we saw was just these really creative ways that people were using digital media to find ways to kind of connect, to, to take the type of social experiences that were brought them so much um, solace and happiness in the day-to-day -day life and to, to bring it to, to the, the digital world. So. You know, I, one great example um, of this specific one was there was a, a YouTube channel um, that did a digital pub trivia. He was just like, I miss pub trivia. That's where I hung out with my friends. That was my community. I'm dying without it. I'm going to create this virtual pub trivia. A hundred thousand people watched his virtual pub trivia every night. I don't know if Guinness got involved, but people are like, is this the largest game of pub trivia that has like ever happened outside of a game show? And it was just an example of someone taking this thing that was part of their happiness and figuring out a way to bring it together digitally. Um, then moving on to the topic of like societal adversity, you know, 2020 among other things was obviously the year where uh, America and many other countries continue to reckon with racial justice and our history of inequality and injustice that different communities, particularly you know, the, the black and brown community have, have been faced with. And we saw that resonance and that awakening really come through very powerfully in the digital media space. And I know we don't have a, a lot of time, but like the one trend that was so powerful to me that, I, that I'll leave you guys with in this space was um, there was a, a, a video that re was released in 2009, because like, let's all be real, these problems, it's like, they're not new, they've existed for a very long time. But this creator named Artie Lockhart released a video in 2009. And the video just had the title of like, it was him discussing what it was like to be black in America. And that video kind of just went out there, not a lot happened, got some viewership, but not so much. But then what we saw through like somatic analysis was like, you know, 2012, 2016, more and more you started to see videos with the words um, being black in, being published and uploaded to YouTube. And then last year, this trend just exploded. And it wasn't just in America. You saw videos of people explaining their lived in personal experience of being black in Germany, being black in Italy, in the Netherlands. You had people describing their experience of um, being black in different sub communities, whether or not it was like being black in tech or being black in art or being black in, you know, the book and literature community. And it represented this community that was using digital media as a form to really share their own very personal, um, very identifiable experience with this thing that they've been struggling with and that really collectively we as a society, you know, uh, was very viscerally confronted with the last year. 
And so the, the number of videos and the number, amount of viewership that you saw happened to this. And this is like one small piece of a much, much larger and complex puzzle. But I think it, it showed to me just how people could use digital media as a way to take this thing that was, you know, in some ways, this very big societal problem and to bring it down to their own personal level. And you could see from the viewership that was then resonating with other people's lived in and personal experiences as well. Listen, I think it's great to have number five be that sense of humanity that kind of ties it back. Um, because one of the questions, and now we'll get to some of the questions was, okay, what happens? What happens to human beings? What happens to artists? What, how do we feel about that? And you know that idea of humanity. Um, I, I write about this a lot. That we are increasingly digital, but there's yet we're all psyched to get outside and go to an event, go to a concert, go to some kind of experience because nothing beats that kind of experience, that shared experience. And I I violently believe that. Look, I'm. I'm um, a different era than you, but I, <laughs> but I certainly, uh, uh, you see that just in the data in terms of polling of young people and experiences matter more and, are, and people are willing to pay more for experiences and it's less important how much or how many material possessions you have. So I wanna, I, my part of it end with that kind of soul, but let's ask some, uh, let's answer some questions. I have a bunch here that were sent in in advance. Wow. But, um, are, are overachievers sending in questions in advance. Oh, that's what they do. That's what they do. And I'll stick I around guys, if, you, Peter. if you want to, um, if you want to ask about Creative University too. So Anna asks, let's start there. Do you, so do you think virtual friends can replace real ones fully? Okay. So I, I will, I'll give you my personal answer and then I'll give you the answer that deeply scares me. Okay. So my personal answer is, I don't think so. Like, I'd like to think that for me, in my personal life up until this point, I, you know, there's something about the lived experience and meeting people IRL that just, to me, like, I get a lot of joy out of that. I get a lot of enjoyment. I love to travel. I'm like, how do I, you know, would I enjoy as much traveling with a virtual friend to like a virtual Italy? I don't know. I don't think so. If you don't know the difference because you're in a world that's immersive and the technology is so good that you feel like, you know, who knows, but go yeah, ahead. And, and that's what I was going to say. It's like my personal belief is no, but at the same time, I feel like technology has a track record and human behavior as a track record of, you know, it's that classic trope of like the dad being like, oh, you young whippersnappers, like back in my day, I had to drive my own car. And I'm literally like, that's me. Is my kid gonna have to have a driver's license? Well, I don't think so. Probably by the time my kid is of driving age, all the cars are gonna drive themselves. So well, yeah, I, it's because really of difficult. Technology by the way, or because of Google technology. Yeah, us among many other people in the space. But it's, um, so my personal belief is, I don't think virtual uh, humans will ever fully replace human humans. But at the same time, I could see the trends that suggest there might be a place where not everybody, but will there be someone who enjoys the companionship and the, the friendship of a virtual human more than a flesh and blood person, it doesn't seem that impossible to me. Okay, so here's a quick quick example. I, I don't think so, but I can't put my finger on it. I just gotta believe that nothing replaces humanity. Yeah, I just have to believe that, but I can't finger, I can't put my finger on why, because technology is transforming so quickly. But one example, Nick, Nick and I did meet once physically in the same room, the first time we met. So, but ever since that time for months and months, it's been this. Yeah. And so let's say we never met the first time. And there's a guy I'm doing business with right now who I've never met before, but we're like really close because we do this and we're doing a business deal. So I don't know if that guy's real. I don't know. You know, he, that this could be Lil Michaela business yeah. version. 
you know, so it's, it's crazy stuff. Okay. Then um, Andreas asks, who is going to benefit most from NFTs? So those are the non-fungible tokens. Artists, huge M&E firms. So that's mergers and uh, acquisitions and things. So that's big, you know, big financial institutions or Wall Street investors who are going to benefit the most out of NFTs. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think it'll be, I'd love your thoughts on this, Peter. My personal hunch is I think it would be um, kind of all of the above. I think this is, you know, it's a new asset class that has never existed before. And I don't see it as an asset class that's necessarily, um, that is, uh, what's the word? That, that uh, can like, I'm totally blanking the word, but it's not taking away wealth from another asset class. Yeah, it's like, not cannibalizing. It's like cannibalizing, thank you. Yeah. I, I see it as an incremental asset class, not cannibalization. And so yeah. I think artists will benefit from it because the people who figure out a way, fundamentally, it's just another way to drive scarcity. So the people who exactly. unlock the way to create an NFT that feels really special and really unique, I think they'll be able to generate a tremendous amount of value in it. And then you're going to have companies that pop up to be able to facilitate the manipulation and the exchange of that value. So if you think about Coinbase, which uh, either just IPO'd or it's about to IPO. Yeah, it's right? about to IPO. So you have the, the, you know, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were one store of value, but then you have a whole ecosystem that pops up to facilitate the buying, selling, manipulation, loaning of that asset class. And so you could imagine, right, Sotheby's, which is like one of the biggest global auction houses, I guarantee has a SWAT team on the ground right now learning everything that they can about NFTs to figure out what the auction uh, economy looks like for these digital, you know, art and asset classes. What do yeah. you think, Peter? No, I, I t listen. I, I kind of mentioned it at the beginning. I don't think NFTs are are flash in the pan. You know, this is points the way of yet another. Like you said, it's scarcity. It's a new asset class. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think art. I think super fans benefit a lot. Because like in the Kings of Leon case, that rock and roll band, they released, as I said, an al their latest album is an NFT. There's limited edition. So there's X number. Let's say there's, you know, 5,000 of them. And so only those 5,000 fans can have that experience because it's like all securitized on, you know, via blockchain technology. And so it, it can't be shared. You can sell it from what I understand, but you can't really share it. And so but it's not just the songs you can put in any kind of content that you want like grimes for digital art that just sold for six million dollars in 24 hours that's because it is a one of a kind i think there were some videos that she created as part of that mm -hmm. you know there were a number of different things that she sold off in that in that auction and it's kind of like old world tangible collectibles. It's the same thing. Totally. It's like getting a signed vinyl album like I have here in my office someplace that now you just have it in a different form and you also have the opportunity to mix and match. You can imagine, and I'm talking to some people right now about creating, uh, because I believe in the artist super fan that there's so much money that's out there and so many experiences for fans out there that they're willing to pay for where you combine both tangible with NFTs and create some super packages that are just fascinating. Like, so I think that the artists can benefit because it's a new way for them to engage with fans. It's a new form of creativity um, with endless possibilities. And so it helps them get a, make a living. It helps them interact with fans in a new way. It helps them create art in a new way. And yet the human, the, like the, the super fan has a new way to um, directly connect with and support their artist and enjoy the art. Uh, so I think everybody wins. And then of course the facilitators in that, like the financial institutions, of course, there's always a middleman, but here's the thing. There historically has been the middleman. There doesn't need to be the middleman now. That's the beauty. Well, with smart contracts and blockchain, you're completely right. Totally. And, and you have your own marketing machine through your social media feeds. So anyhow. Uh, I think here's, here's one idea. Okay. You can start finding the next question, but yes, here's the question. When are we going to see the first 
NFT museum, because I guarantee that's going to happen at some point. Like the first location, like the Met or MoMA, where you have to physically be there in order to actually view this collection of digital assets. Okay. 2023 is my bet. Okay. Okay. (laughs) We got to get some investors on that one. Okay. Jasmine asks, do you think these types of things would have happened without COVID maybe just in 10 more years instead of today? That's the question. So the Uh, things that you were talking about. Yes, I I think so. To me, I think um, COVID to me wound up being just a magnifying glass and an accelerator of what was kind of already happening beneath the surface. So, you know, I think this evolution of the workplace was going to happen at some point. It's just now been pushed up 20 years. And I think the same thing with like theatrical distribution where, you know, the, the movie houses and the, the um, studios have been fighting for years on what's the length of time that should exist between when a movie's in a movie theater and when you should be able to watch it on Netflix at home. Yeah. And I think the, you know, COVID again, just accelerated that timeline. So absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. That's exactly right. All these things, you can't stop it. And so this gets to Chloe's question next. Do you think trends like virtual artists and short form content will cannibalize some of the existing revenue streams for artists or will those trends just lead to brand new development strategies and revenue opportunities? Um, I'll, I'll touch upon that one. Yeah, go for it. Don't mind. Um, so this is happening. Like that's why you need to know about digital humans, virtual beings, all the AI driven creation for everybody should be aware of these trends. And that's why like we, I w- wish we could pick Nick's brain more about this stuff, but so this is all happening now. What does it mean for the artist ultimately? No one knows. I think that obviously, I think one thing that is critical is to know that it's happening. And just like artists always have, artists have, smart artists have always stayed ahead or at least current with the technology available to them at the time and frequently leverage that new technology to create new forms of art. So. Art doesn't, the, the virtual beings and the virtual art and AI driven creativity doesn't need to necessarily cannibalize. I think there will be significant cannibalization. I do think, I guess personally, cause I'm a humanity kind of person, but I think that I, I miss the soul idea, like the incredible soul and love and passion that I don't think AI can ever replicate. Um, but I think that AI, songwriting as an example, is going to be able to churn out some pretty amazing music over time. And that's scary to me. Maybe it shouldn't be scary, but it is because I'm a huge music fan and I believe in the artist and I want the artist to succeed and I want creativity at a human level to succeed. But I think there will be that guys. And I think that, you know, there's already scripts that are being written by artificial intelligence you know, they're not necessarily great right now, but it's always exponential learning. It learns, 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 learns. And so what does that mean? And then we have non-location shooting happening on, um, the, on the Mandalorian, as an example. So now all those jobs that were out location scouting and doing all, all of those production people, you don't need that anymore because Mandalorian is using new technology that's never been utilized before to reduce costs massively and that's all driven by new technology. So all these forces are around you, but technology has always disrupted business too. So Nick, <laughs> your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with everything you said. I think there's gonna be some cannibalization and then some incrementality new opportunity. So I think agree with you completely, the advent of artificial intelligence, songwriting and, you know, if you assume that there's like a finite pie of the amount of money that people will spend on entertainment or on, you know, influencers, like if the number of, you know, people, uh, uh, if you have a, a whole advent of creator class that's virtual peer, like theoretically that could cannibalize money from existing creators. But I do think it will also lead to a lot of incremental opportunities. Cause like we actually heard this so much 
when YouTube started where people are like, you know, it used to be, there were so many gatekeepers in the media industry. You had six movie studios, three labels. And if you wanted to do anything in the like music television and like four broadcast networks, four broadcast networks, six studios, three labels. And if you wanted to do any movie, TV or music, you had to like work through those folks. Yeah. Um, but now like with YouTube, the number of stars that are making, you know, a million or a hundred thousand of dollars a year off the platform is like skyrocketing. And so the, the industry has changed, but there's a lot of like wealth generation that is happening because you have more access to content and you're seeing other business opportunities being created off the back of that. By the way, um, Martin Myers, so Martin, are you still with us? Type in again if you are. So Martin says we are watching in South America. It's 9.30 p.m. This is lit. So Martin, thanks, thanks for, for tuning in, Martin. Thanks. Where in South America are you from if you're still watching? Although no, no I think it's South Africa. Uh, it's South Africa. America. It's South Africa. Right, Martin? Yeah, because uh, Martin's joined us before. That's, that's awesome, by the way. Um, Nick, I want to ask you something, Nick. So do you you know, I haven't asked you about this and I'll let you answer or not answer, um, but I'll ask you some hard questions Go about, for it. about YouTube or technology enablers. Obviously, algorithms and artificial intelligence, depending on how they're set and what the rules of the game are, create outcomes. And so platforms and social media are getting dis you know, frequently disparaged by the fact that, you know, whether it's hate speech, whether it's... Um, um, you know, inciting violence and emotions and all that sort of thing. You know, that's one theme. As we were talking about AI and disruption of employment, I mean, another theme is, is there any, just what is your view of social responsibility, like the humanity for a platform like a YouTube, like these big platforms, not only for the kind of the obvious subjects that everybody's talking about, but also for replacement, like, soul replacement, art replacement, you know, taking the role of the songwriter, like really challenging it and creativity. You know, I'm curious to get your philosophical humanistic thoughts about all that. Yeah, I mean, you asked a lot of, of really good questions in there. I mean, I think what's, what stands out to me right now, and again, this is kind of my own, my own personal humanistic view on this, um, is it's interesting to me right now that a lot of people have talked about like it feels like we live in this post post truth environment um and one of the things that i've heard which is interesting is like a corollary of we live in this post truth environment is the sense that um we live in a moment where when you think about like what is right or what is wrong and like morality we're you know we're going a little bit away from the business thing we're not like putting our morality hats on which is critical but when you start to think about like and by the way venus we'll get to your question too because it's a you know it's an interesting question yeah um would so it feels increasing like like we live in this world where um people are talking about like it like what's right is not so much an absolute definition of like right and wrong, but it feels more it's like what what can you get away with? Like, and you see increasingly some public figures where it's like, as long as I can get away with it, then like more power to you, that's entrepreneurial. And I think that's a, a very destructive view of morality a bit. And that in and of itself worries me. Um there was uh, a, a, a recent, I think it was recent, a relatively recent philosophical treatise um, by this author. I think his name was, uh, uh, no, mess it up, but um, I believe he, he was a, a philosopher. I think he taught it uh, one of the IVs, but his main treatise was on this idea of what we owe to each other. And I thought this was like a very interesting idea of morality because it suggests that like it takes you out of this individualistic lens and more into this idea that like we as 
human beings like kind of owe to each other a sense of, of respect and you know being good to each other which which deeply resonates with me and so you know i think so much of what we but need how do you build that because it of course you know if it, and i know you and i know it does and i i say of, of course but you know let's uh and i'm not asking you to speak for you two yeah okay i'm not i would never be so bold as to do that <laughs> but but how do you build what you just said into the into a machine like a youtube or a facebook or any social platform and I want to touch upon Venus's question here because it's a challenging one, but an important one. So I'm going to read it. OK, yeah. Um, With all due respect, when asked about optimism, your response, if we learned anything from 2020, it's easy to get lost in the muck of racism and politics. What does this say about your core beliefs, how you influence YouTube and how the users are affected, i.e. YouTube not banning toxic and dangerous campaign against Africa, or excuse me, America by 45. What do you believe is YouTube's responsibility to its users in creating a safe space or racial equality to create? Has YouTube considered having the Martin Luther King Center teach racial equality and justice to your executive team to better serve the community? If not, what has YouTube done to re-educate its executives and board members? Does YouTube feel its responsibility to brown and black users? There's a lot there, obviously. And, uh, but I'm just gonna throw it out to you. That's from Venus and your thoughts yeah so first off Venus, thank you for asking that question i think it's a fantastic question um and i also think you know andrew andreas in the chat also asked this question around um with hollywood still failing the bechdel wallace test can algorithms ensure equal representation so a couple of thoughts on these things because i think they're different questions but there's elements of it that are overlapped um so I think first and foremost to answer it, like I personally continue to work at YouTube because I believe that YouTube ultimately is a platform for good and that it can drive really important impacts. And recently we actually just announced something that I'm very proud of, which is called um, the YouTube uh, Black Content Fund, uh, specifically the YouTube Black Voices Fund and this is a, a fund that we released that's really focused on promoting the rich diversity of creator and the artist community to uh, that we believe is so crucial to making YouTube inclusive and equitable. And so what this is, is it's a fund to um, kind of similar to Creative University, but we select a group of creators and artists um, from all over the world. And the goal is to help amplify fresh narratives and content that specifically emphasize the intellectual power, um, passion, and, and joy of this brilliant community, including specifically like Black economic equity and well being. And so, from a values perspective, like that is critically important to us, and we have a very important role to play in that. Um, and then the other piece, which I think is important, like Peter, you mentioned this a couple of times, and this was the, the piece that I, I hear in Andrea's question is around like algorithms. And when you have yeah. you know, machines making the decisions and to, this is the piece that, that is, you know, at the end of the day, algorithms are being designed by humans. And so like the, 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 like a human's perspectives, understandings, biases, you know, there's risk that those then kind of get imported into algorithms. And now this is like way outside the stuff that I work on in YouTube, but there's a whole bunch of really smart people focused on making sure that those biases don't carry over into the algorithms. But what it also means and what is so critically important is that it also comes down to like our education system and the training that leaderships at you know, Fortune 500 companies do to make sure that their uh, employees are aware of these biases, that they're filling pipelines to create diverse in employee base and to have diversity in leadership positions. Um, and so you know, it's, it's not a short-term answer, but I think it's so much around making sure that we, uh, 
as a community that care about these issues, make sure that we are teaching a generation of employees and, and especially leaders, because I think the onus is really on the leaders of these organizations to drive this type of impact, to make sure that they have a talent pool and a set of folks building these algorithms that are as representative of the audiences and communities that we know our products are serving. By the way, listen, I'm gonna just kind of my, my high level on this. First of all, I have no idea where all of this is gonna go, you know, obviously. Obviously, that's sorry, guys, but you know, clearly that's <laughs> I have no idea. But I do believe that um, all forms of media, all forms are naturally have evolved so far to a point where they fuel things that that affect our brains in a certain way. And you know, I watch I listen to Scott Galloway a lot, who's hilarious, but really dead on in so many different ways. And, you know, the things that get us like engaged as human beings, sadly, a lot of the times are the negative impulses where we start like, you know, we, we, uh, uh, our impulses get wired that way. And so the algorithms are, re you know, I'm, and I'm not speaking about any individual company, but in general and media buys for traditional media too, it's that, you know, obviously initially fueled more and more the same. So you start going down rabbit holes and then you start hearing fewer and fewer diverse voices. And so you start getting your mindset, all the things that we're dealing with as a society. I think my personal feeling is that there's gonna be a reckoning of some kind. I don't know what that looks like, but I, part of the things that we can do is for whatever form of media is that we vote with our dollars. You know, We vote with what we watch. And so if we can turn things around, I think it's hard for any, once algorithms have been put in place and business models have been established, it's gonna be a real challenge for anybody to try to turn that around and take it back and recalibrate. I think, I, at least I personally see some early signs of that happening, which give some hope there. And, um, you know, Nick, you're this young, great philosopher king that's gonna be able to have an impact and those who are, you know, in those kind of positions will be able to have impact to do that. And I know that I've read enough about like what YouTube's doing where there has been like Susan, who's the CEO, I can never pronounce her last name. Wojcicki. Of, of YouTube has been very open about that in podcasts I've listened to where algorithms were trained a certain way. And there, then there became a realization that that was not the intent. And so there's some steps that are being taken. You know, how much is enough or has it happened yet? Hopefully it's happening across all forms of media, by the way. So it's already 1226. I'm going to ask a couple more questions. All right. I think I have time for one more because okay. I, I unfortunately okay. have to jump to a 1230 meeting. Okay. So, all right. This is great. I, I wish I were already like a little bit over. Uh, okay. So... Mar um, since Martin was from Cape Town, the 90 second video is, is that the ideal length for commentary on a topic? What captions on? Just really quickly, going back to something that's very practical. Uh, yeah, you know, sorry, just, say, that, say that question one more time. The 90 second video, is that the ideal length for commentary on a topic? Oof. Um, so the short answer is I, I truly believe that there is no ideal length. Like you have to let the content dictate the length of content. Because for example, you, you know, for commentary on a topic, there can be so many different types of topics. And I think, you know, the ideal amount of time that you would want to create a really resonant video on, you know, a, a short kind of comedic joke might be a lot shorter than the amount of time that you need to, uh, you know, do commentary on more complex topics or issues. And I'll, I'll leave you um, with one last kind of example or recommendation, because this was something that it was uh, in 2020. Get, Peter, I know I'll just have to do this for you. Guess how long the number two, like most trended video on YouTube in 2020, guess how long that video was? Uh, 25 seconds. 20 minutes. Oh, wow. 20 minutes. Wow. And I recommend you check it out. It's the, like, 
it I love it. It's it's this video by this incredible creator named um, Mark Rober. And it's a video of like he's in COVID and he realizes that um, his squirrels are uh, eating, like stealing the, 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 the walnuts out of his like bird feeder, which is intended for his birds. So he starts to want to, he, you know, he's a very creative mind and he wants to figure out just how far these squirrels will go to like get, you know, the food intended for the birds. And so he creates a, a squirrel designed ninja warrior optical course with like whirly twirly things. And it is, it's just, it's so creative. It's so smart. And it's a 20 minute video, over 60 million views. Kristen, Kristen just put the just, link in. Kristen just I'll leave you with it. one Thank thing. You. Don't tell your parents, just like blow off some homework and go watch that video. It is, it's just incredible. And so that was a video, like it, you're gonna say I'm crazy, but when you watch it, you're like, it makes sense. That needed to be a 20 minute video about squirrels uh, navigating a Ninja Warrior optical course to get bird feed, so. I love it. Listen, I know you gotta run, but I wanna say one thing about you. You are, Nick is a great philosopher, um, great, um, uh, the, the goals are all the right goals for what he does. Uh, I do want to point out like some of the lead initiatives that you that you're taking the lead in are things like response to COVID um, and a lot of the positive changes and you know transformations and addressing a lot of social need too. So I think that's great. So you know they, these are you know I, I'm very positive that like with AI surrounding us and with all these kind of forces surrounding us, like that's why we do Creative University. You know, so we can talk about all these things and we can find ways and connect them with each other. But Nick, thank you so much for joining. We, we could talk about all this stuff for so much longer. But yeah, and uh, I just I, I want to say one thing. Um, I just I want to thank Peter for putting this together. This guy, I'm sure you all know this at this point, but Peter is one of the most genuine, authentic, smartest leaders in all of the media and entertainment space. And the fact that when COVID happened, that he was one of the first emails I got of trying to find a way to, to do good and to give back and to just, you know, help, um, you know, people during a time of, of, you know, work stopping and schools being disrupted. And, you know, you, you've seen the, the you know, all-star lineup of people that he has coming you know, in the next couple of weeks and in the past couple of weeks. And that is all just a reflection of the type of person that Peter is. So Peter, it was a joy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I just hope, you know, all you guys watching this um, appreciate just what a, a genuine and amazing human Peter is for, for organizing this. And so thank you, Peter. And uh, I hope we get to do this again soon sometime. We'll do it again. And thank you so much. That's, that's really beautiful thoughts. And guys, everybody out there, I really want to help and we want Nick's joining this like he was so enthusiastic to be part of this because all we all want to help you guys, you know, we see it ourselves in our own lives with our own kids all the, you know, my son's an 18 year old he's a high school senior and like many of you out there, he's not gonna have a graduation this year, you know it sucks. Um, my daughter who's a, a junior at, at in college she's not going to school this semester because she can't have any experience and the cost involved and all the kinds of issues that we're talking about. And that just sucks. You know, we feel terrible for all of you. So in our own little way, if we can help, if we can help you get that relationship, that relationship that can lead to the first opportunity, that opportunity can lead to like Nick was able to take Razorfish and then go into YouTube and transform the world, help, you know, change the world. Like that's what gives us joy and excitement. Anam, who was on this call, probably isn't because this is the longest session ever. <laughs> the fact that she got a gig out of Creative University, you know how happy that, that like that's what it's all about. Huge. One, so one huge. last anecdote I've said several times, but it's just such a great one. Um, in one of the early sessions, there was an anonymous question from somebody who, who to Sarah Harden, um, who's CEO of Hello Sunshine, Reese Witherspoon's company. And it was, you know, Sarah, what's the deal here? I have 
um, submitted my resume to over 100 companies over the course of a year and a half. Not a single one has responded to us. Not a single one has responded to me. And so we said, let's take a look at it. She said, can you take a look at it? And we said, absolutely, take a look at it. So we asked Creative University students who really want to get involved to send a video of themselves too so we know what they're about. We just get a sense of who they are so we can better place and help you and get to know you. So the, this young woman, Daria, did um, and yada, 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 after not having any response to over 100, 150 resumes in a year and a half, she is now probably going to get a full-time job at DreamWorks Animation. She wanted to get an animation. She's already done her second stint internship, so she got that immediately because we were able to connect the dots after we got to know her. Like, that's what it's about, you know, if we can help you there, guys. So, Nick, I'm going to let you go. Um, that You were very generous with your time. Because yeah, this listen, was meant to be an hour. Happy to help. And it's a delight to talk to you. And, you know, I, I hope this was interesting, stimulating, created some ideas for folks, was helpful. Um, so happy to do it. Good to see you, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye, everyone. See you guys. We'll make it available um, on the YouTube channel very shortly. And check out all the other videos, too. And then it will be in podcast format in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. I guess. Yeah.